in Armenia. And let's start. Here is Mike. Mike is Java developer first, and now is an Atlassian consultant. And he found in Doros, he found, ah, excuse me, the micro, and he found in Doros uh, IT consulting firm in France and now in Armenia. And here is this favorite quote. Yes. So be careful about question you are going to ask him at, at the end of this talk. And this is Eric. He's a software developer for 20 years and very active in the agile French community for more than five years. And this is his favorite code. So just guess uh, which one. Which one of his random problem? <laughs> I have a secret for you. I start to learn English yesterday in the, in the evening. And Fabrice gave me a French lesson. And my first center, center, sentence is Where is a giant? Agile is in the kitchen. <laughs> yes. And perhaps the kitchen <laughs> is the next thema of Frugagile in 2022. Yes, it's for you, Fabrice. <laughs> so my English, it's not fluent. It's a big challenge to be here today. But I like challenges for the life. Michael will support me during this talk. So let's go, Michael. Let's go. So let's start with some pointers on agility history. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Sounds familiar. <laughs> yes. Next. A few years after, I was at the university in France and I learned the waterfall project management. This approach is, can only be successful. Why? It's very simple. Because at the beginning, you think, you think, and you think in all the details. After, you plan, you plan, you plan in all the details. So at the end, it's easy. You have only to construct. And after I start to work. And we use this project management, management method. And every day was chaos. Every project was chaos. But I was happy because I was a professional. In the 80s, Robert Martin, already talent, but young at this moment, was already involved in project management improvement. And all his managers told him, asked him, Robert, why are we late every time? He answered, I don't know. It's not my problem. It's yours. I'm a programmer. In 86, terms Scrum start to emerge in some methodologies. Oh, do you know this guy? He passed away. He passed away in 91, 91, excuse me. In 95, Ken Schwaber published a, a, a series of articles, Scrum Methodology was born. In 99, Ken Beck, Ward Cunningham, and Ron Jeffries publish Extreme Programming. 
And finally, in 2001, 2001, Agile Manif Manifesto arrived. So, in the winter in 2001, 17 guys uh, met in a um, ski resort in America. And during the week, between two ski sessions, between LC meals, no alcohol, no cheese, they co wrote this manifesto. This document is very easy, is very simple, is very concise, only four values and 12 principles. It was 20 years ago, happy birthday. Okay. Um, so we will talk about this Agile Manifesto. And um, first of all, I want to say Agile was very promising. Agile was promising for better work. And lots of companies uh, tried to implement it, organize themselves, change their processes, but it failed. Still, Agile is very popular now. We had an agile big bang around 2001, but everything started before that. We already had people thinking about new way of working, just like those guys, uh, Andy Hunt and David Thomas, who wrote the pragmatic programming. Then the same Robert Martin that we saw before um, wrote about clean code. One of a series um, of books around clean code. And he introduced in the same year a fifth value proposition for the Agile Manifesto craftsmanship over execution. This led to the Software Craftsmanship Manifesto in 2009. The Software Craftsmanship uh, Manifesto was all around this one principle of the Agile Manifesto, continuous attention to technical excellence and good designs that enhance agility. All was left apart um, around, around a technical edge and therefore we had this uh, need to, uh, to go more technical. And therefore, uh, this manifesto is, is focusing on this uh, principle. And with those values, mastering technical skills in IT, uh, user groups, communities, and continuous training that was very important. What we want to stress here is during the 10 first years of Agile, um, lots of companies failed to implement it because they left apart the technical edge. Therefore, we had this need to go more technical and therefore uh, we could see now that there are more, there are more uh, communities, um, agile communities, craft communities that are somehow against each other. But that's weird because somehow they're sharing the same values. So Miguel, now could we answer this first important question? Agility, what is it? So what is agile? What is agile? Agile is all of this, right? Yes, I think so. And uh, so if you have all these methods, practices, you can implement them, then you get agile, easy, right? And then it means your company is agile too. Yes. But I think it doesn't work. Why are we missing the essential? The agile manifestos notice this trouble. And they begin to guide us. They told us there is a fundamental differences between being agile 
and doing the job. So, Mikhail, we have an answer now about this question. I well, think so. I think so too. So, agile is um, a mindset you should have, a set of values, and it all leads to one thing a human adventure. Right? Of course, it's a human adventure because Agile intend to put back the human at the center of the work we know. And therefore, it, it takes also all the fact that we are a human, we are not perfect, we can do mistakes, uh, we can take, sometimes we cannot take decision, we have difficulties to make choices, and we take that into account. And therefore, it's a human adventure. Yes. So, what a beautiful picture. This picture is a festival in France called Jazz à Vienne. Vienne is a little city in the south area in France. The concept is getting ready. But what will be happen in the next few hours? Nobody knows. In what mood are musicians? What the energy emerge from the audience? And what about the weather? The rain, the cold wind, and what about technical issues? Instruments, the sound system, the lights, nobody knows and so many incertitudes, but magic will happen. So now we have two manifesto and we begin to understand what is agility. Let's start to see more in details the software craftsman posture. When you are a software craftsman, you are a professional. And when you are a professional developer, you are a practitioner. In this context, you have two responsibilities. The first one is to work your practice. And the second one is to be committed in the project you built. Oh, 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 moment. Don't be afraid. A software craftsman is a professional, is not a killer. This picture is only a tribute to Jean Paul Belmondo, a French actor, actor passed away a few weeks ago. So, first of all, pra the craftsman is a practitioner. In this context, he has to train himself during all his career, every single day. And it's difficult because it's a long, it's a long way. If you don't have practice, if you don't train, your practice get lost your practice go away. It's possible to learn new languages, new frameworks, new patterns. I think it's a good idea to practice the basic of programming, for example, algorithm, uh, data structures, difficult, it's a very difficult subject, and design patterns. And also, it's important to read reference books, blogs, and go to conferences. In conclusion of this practice, it's important to know that it's the responsibility of the software craftsman to do all these tasks. It's not the responsibility of your employer to give time for this. It is the responsibility of the craftsman. 
And now let's talk again about Miles Davis. Miles Davis is a very famous musician and we want to do the comparison. Miles Davis um, signed his labels to record, label, to record, compose, write music, play music, go to interviews, um, sign autographs and play in concert. But what would happen if he wouldn't play his music, wouldn't practice a lot, work a lot? He wouldn't be able to bring a new edge to his music, bring something new, be, have his own personality, have his own improvisation, adaptation of his music, of, of jazz music. And therefore, he wouldn't be a professional. Sure. The second uh, subject of the software, the software partner and posture is the curiosity. The curiosity drives us to discover new people, new approach, new mindset. But there is no real curiosity without humility. Because without humility, the real discover becomes impossible. For example, a few months ago, I started to learn uh, functional programming. At the beginning, it, it was a mess. I was hungry every day. Because I am 47 years old, and it becomes difficult for me to only code a simple algorithm, a simple sort of array, for example. But now I'm happy because I, my understanding of functional programming is better. And the most important is that I have a better global understanding of all programming languages. Don't be so hard on yourself. <laughs> so back to my Davis. Um, this guy is amazing. He uh, worked on an opera. Uh, Borgia and Bess, and also I uh, record sketches of Spain. Uh, from the title, you could say that uh, he brought some Spanish music influence in his music. And what we can stress out here is like he actually managed to look out, out of the box, play out of the box. Yes and listen to music out of the box, what he could bring back to his jazz music. And this is amazing. So what we want to say here is sometimes you need to look out of the box and bring new influences to the craft you are doing. And it, uh, humility is the most important skills in this context. Third dimension, is the commitment. When you adopt the software craftsman posture, you have to commit to committing in the project you build. You have to believe in what you do every day. And it's difficult because often you have to convince other people. I think a developer is not a uh, subordinate. This idea is already present in a lot of, uh, of firm culture. And I think it's a disaster, a big disaster. It's a disaster for the product. It's a disaster for the quality of the product. And it's a disaster for the business. When you are a um, software craftsman in this context, you have to challenge specification. So you have to, you know, to say, yes, I will do that. But the most important and the most difficult is that you know to, you know to say, no, I don't do that because I think it's not good for the product. But the software craftsman know the business constraint. So he proposed another approach. 
And at the end, the software craftsman write code. For managers, it's important to understand that is this code delivered to the customers. So it's very important, this uh, task. And this code is shared with the team, is not the, proper, the property of the software craftsman. The code is a team staff. The code is written with team rules. The code is maintained by the team and this code has to be alive during all the life of the product. With this important approach, the responsibility, I think it's the most important responsibility of the team is to have the software control. Back to Miles Davis again. Um, Miles Davis was always, um, had always one commitment. He was committed to his music, work hard on his music, work all his life for his music. And in the 1969, he, he uh, released the record in a silent way. And in 1970, Beaches Brew. Those two records were for the first time introducing electric instruments. And now we know jazz, electric jazz, fusion, that is part of our life. And it's thanks to my studies. Now that we saw with Eric, the software craftsman's posture. Now we will see how we can implement this in companies. We'll go through values, how we can hire craftsmen and craftswomen, and how to be team centric. First, values are key. It's very important for um, for us in our company to put a focus on the team. Team goes first. Team is um, a blend of all the people that work with us. And what we wanted in our company is to bring uh, this, um, these people together with different skills and especially different craftsmen and craftswomen who would master their craft and will share knowledge uh, among us. Um, also, one thing I would like to say, it's about responsibilities, another uh, value for us. Responsibility is very important because it's okay to make mistakes. We are human after all, but you should take responsibility for the mistakes you do and fix it. So if you code wrong, you do bugs, mm -hmm then fix it and humility because all the success and failure need to be embraced by the team so we can grow together. In, in 1959, the Miles Davis Quintet entered in studio for recording kind of good. This photo is amazing because we can see John Coltrane, Karen Bolladorne, Miles Davis, and Bill Evans. And there is also Jimmy Cobb on the drums and Paul Chambers at the bass. Before the recording, Miles Davis gave minimal instructions, minimal, only few um, guidelines. In a few takes, all the album was improvised, only guided by values and vision of the project. Kind of Blue is a masterpiece. Kind of Blue is in the music history. And now let's talk about higher craft. What we are looking for in our company when we hire people is especially individuals 
their uniqueness, what they can bring to our team with their culture. We think that they can enrich our own company culture. And when we are hiring as well, what we look for is not diplomas so much. It's uh, more about how much you can adapt and how much you can learn and how much you can share with it. And I have a one question for you guys. Do you think we should hire people who have similar skills than us? Or should we actually hire people who would bring something new to our team and especially the skills we are missing to build our skyrocket? Here is a perfect example in the Miles Davis uh, career. This guy, this guy is Tony Williams. He entered in the Miles Davis Quintet in the middle of the 60s. He was only, only 17 years old. He exploded with an abyss. He exploded music schema. It was very difficult for Mike Davis because at this moment, Mike Davis was already an international star. But Mike Davis guided, guided his musicians. He gave, he gave him uh, a space of creativity, a space of freedom. So, Miles Davis grew up in contact of all his musicians, and all the Miles Davis musicians grew up in contact of Miles Davis. One thing that is very important, I already told you about this. Um, we are team centric. Um, team is, is key for us. Um, what we think is like when we bring a team together in front of clients, we are bringing a set of people, a set of individuality, but also a set of skills. And that makes the client more confident for, for us to make the, to get the job done, be team centric. Of course, of course. The team is the most important concept in live music and in music. A band builds itself during the time, concert after concert, repetition after repetition, recording after recording. Improvisation is the most important um, uh, dimension of jazz music, but improvisation is also important in all the type of music. During a concert, musicians see other musicians, see the audience, listen what happened. So in the present, they change the plan. They support another musicians if there is a technical issue. The team serve the show in the present every time. So we arrived at the conclusion again. And we will conclude with this quote from Plato. If you want to control the people, start by controlling their music. Yes, but we see that music is out of control. Thank you. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Uh, very well done. Pretty difficult, right, to yes. be here on stage? Yes. Um, speaking in English. Uh, what was my English? Perfect. <laughs> uh, if there's any questions, guys, in the Q Q and A, please don't hesitate if you have. Uh, you said about improvisation. Yes. That's a good point. But so if we are going back to software development, do you think that improvisation is the right way to do? Yes, I think so. But I answer in French. 
and Michael will try to run, uh, to translate. Sure, let's do this. Alors, la question est, est-ce que l'improvisation, c'est important euh, durant la phase de développement C'est ça. Dans le développement logiciel. Je pense que c'est une partie, certainement la partie la plus importante, parce que comme je le disais durant l'intervention, parfois, il est fondamental de savoir dire non. Non, je ne pourrais pas faire ça. Non, l'équipe ne pourra pas le faire. Elle ne peut pas s'engager à le faire. Pour plein de raisons, des raisons de planning, des raisons techniques, etc., etc. Et à ce moment précis, il faut savoir improviser. Improviser pour savoir délivrer de la valeur dans le temps qui est imparti. Et souvent, cette improvisation mène à amener tout simplement d'autres approches, quelque chose que, enfin, des, des solutions qui n'étaient pas imaginées en demain. OK, let's try to translate all of this in one go. So do I remember everything? <laughs> you have to improvise. No worries. <laughs> so what uh, Eric was saying, actually, is that sometimes uh, when you are facing technical issues, uh, for instance, uh, you need, uh, as a developer, to say no, that it's not possible to do it, or find another solution, another way. Um, sometimes different approaches bring as well your technical knowledge, stuff you have learned in user groups, for instance, or outside of the company, so you can bring something new. If actually the function, like what is asked to decode is not well uh, specified, for instance, I guess. So um, you are, by improvising, you also um, somehow take the lead and take the responsibility for the work you're doing. Can I? Your English is better than mine. <laughs> but your Italian is better than mine. <laughs> I think so. Si <laughs> uh, We'll say in English. Um, <laughs> you, you, can, you, you, you can translate Italian? Or no, not, uh, I can't. No. <laughs> um, I've got another question. So you, you say uh, there is today two manifestos, the yeah. Agile manifesto and of so the software craftsmanship manifesto, yes. and today they are separate. But sometimes when you are a software developer, you have to choose in a way. And software developers now mainly goes to um, software craftsmanship manifesto and forget that there are also an agile manifesto. To your mind, guys, what could be the next step if we want to join these two manifestos together. I'll try to answer in France. <laughs> it's a difficult question, but it's a very good question. Effectivement, euh, pour moi, c'est un, j'allais dire un drame que ces deux communautés soient disjointes. C'est pas complètement vrai, mais bon, parfois on a l'impression quand même. J'ai l'impression qu'il faudrait euh, que les conférences agiles aillent recruter que du, des développeurs et vice-versa pour que les communautés se rejoignent. Selon ma propre expérience en tant que développeur, bien sûr que je suis actif dans la communauté craft, euh, actif en tant que part, non pas actif en tant que conférencier ou en tant qu'organisateur euh, de conférences, mais je participe, j'apprends, je lis, etc. Et ça me fait pratiquer, progresser dans ma pratique, pardon. En revanche, je me rends compte que pour pratiquer mon métier au quotidien, le plus important, finalement, ce sont les valeurs agiles. Et donc, c'est ça qui me manque. Et j'imagine qu'il peut y avoir l'inverse qui peut se produire, à savoir que les, les managers agiles, que les product owners, les scrum masters, et peut-être besoin de, de, de s'initier à l'artisanat du logiciel, justement pour découvrir l'autre partie et pour comprendre à quel point les deux dimensions, finalement, n'en sont qu'une, elles sont indissociables. L'un ne peut exister sans l'autre. Voilà ma, mon sentiment. Yeah. Difficult to translate. Difficult now to remember. Also, you <laughs> used a lot of complicated words. Yes. <laughs> OK, so. What you said first is like, you think that probably it would be interesting to have in agile conferences, more developers yes. and in craft 
Crossman um, conferences, maybe more. Yes. Um, agile guys. Yes. And uh, what you were saying as well is like, maybe it would be interesting to have a project managers, uh, PO, uh, Scrum masters, uh, discovering as well the craftsmanship manifesto um, and the other way around, developers to be a bit more uh, learning a bit more about Agile as well, because uh, those values are working together. Those two manifestos are working together and one cannot exist without the other. Um, so I think, I think you think, <laughs> because you are in the two communities yes. and you have, the <laughs> you have the fruit in both ones. So what you're saying is like, we should, be looking at those two manifestos together um, to have those all the values together. We cannot just be craftsmen and forget about the agile uh, values because they are bringing something to the work we do every day. Um, so I think uh, yeah, I could, that's it. We've got a question in the chat yes. from Arya. Um, to sum up, could you? Could we say that you have to be a craftsman to become an, uh, an artist or an expert? Thank you, Ariel. <laughs> Very difficult <laughs> question. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. <laughs> Do you have to be a craftsman to become an artist or an expert? Yes, yes. <laughs> Maybe I can answer this one. Yes, and you can complete. Yes, I have, okay, well, I have well, an answer yeah, to the artist dimension. I think in um, I have uh, some experience to share here. Actually, I was uh, I was first a, a developer, and I was working for maybe six months with this uh, previous company I was in, and I was thinking, okay, what will happen when I will be get older, or a senior developer, will I be able to be hired easily? And then I, I discovered that there are user groups about Java because I was a Java developer. And I started to learn like Java much more, go to user group, discover different dimensions about the language. And I could understand better when I would go back to my work. So I'm not comparing myself as an artist, but I would say, um, you need to look outside of the box, you need to practice a lot so you can be better at your, at your art. When you are, when you look at Picasso, when you look at different big, big uh, painters, artists, they started with sketches, they started with different kind of art and they ended with Guernica and they couldn't have done this without bringing toward themselves knowledge, uh, reading, travels, and, and meeting people, and they couldn't have brought that. So I would say, yes, you have to be a craftsman to be an artist. And to be an artist, you need to be a craftsman. <coughs> In French. <laughs> Just une précision sur uh, devenir un artiste. Um, pour moi, l'art est simplement un moyen d'expression, un espace de liberté. Donc, il n'y a aucune méthode, absolument rien. Chacun peut être artiste. Et c'est vrai que dans l'histoire, c'est souvent durant les guerres que les artistes ont su garder cet espace de liberté pour s'exprimer. Voilà, c'est juste un petit mot au passage. Thank you for this addition. I would try to translate it. So, uh, Eric was just saying, uh, art is a way to express yourself. Uh, or to express something. And you need for this no methods, no practices, no principles, but just a space of freedom so you could express yourself. And during the war, wars, uh, in the they managed history. And in the history, they managed to keep this freedom so they can express a lot. Yes. I have another question from the chat also. Um, you say that uh, you. To, to become a craftsman, you have to practice and you have to improve yourself. 
And that is not the responsibility of your boss to give you the time to do that. Yes. But when we work, we have the, uh, a lot of tasks to do. So how can you manage to, to have the time to improve yourself? What, what would you say to, to, to the people who ask, well, how can I do that? Alors, en, en français également, je suis désolé, Michael, je te sauve ici pour le coup pour des traductions. Pour moi, dans, dans la pratique, il y a, il y a, je dirais qu'il y a deux choses. Durant l'activité professionnelle, quand on doit développer euh, un logiciel en équipe, par exemple, on a un certain nombre de technologies qui sont utilisées. Et là, durant les phases de développement, on peut passer du temps à, à s'entraîner, à essayer d'évoluer dans les technologies qu'on utilise au quotidien. Et ça, évidemment, je pense que ça fait partie aussi de l'activité qu'on a sur le plan professionnel au sein de l'entreprise. En revanche, c'est loin d'être suffisant parce que d'autres langages existent, d'autres méthodes existent, d'autres approches existent, d'autres mindsets existent, d'autres paradigmes existent. Et si on commence à creuser, euh, est-ce que... Euh, on se rappelle de comment sont construits les langages, quelles différentes structures de données existent pour être plus efficient d'un côté ou de l'autre. Et c'est là, c'est sur toute cette partie connexe qui finalement est très, très grande, où je pense qu'il faut investir du temps à titre personnel pour évoluer dans sa pratique. Voilà, je pense que le métier de développeur est un métier de praticien, comme les musiciens, comme les médecins, etc., etc., et donc là, c'est plus un investissement personnel hors de son activité professionnelle. D'où, au passage, excuse-moi, Michel, pour conclure, d'où la nécessité d'être passionné par ça. Parce que forcément, si on n'est pas passionné, on a, du mal, on a du mal à aller chercher ce temps par ailleurs. OK. So, <laughs> Michel is the most agile of <laughs> <I'm fixing it. laughs> um, so what you said is um, a developer is a is a practitioner so therefore he needs to practice a lot but also it's a passionate job you need to be passionate about your job to do it and um, what you you state that as an example is like when you start a new project, maybe there will be, even if it's your language, it might be some um, problematics that you have to solve with uh, new frameworks uh, or new way of developing, or maybe some new methods that you don't know yet. And you need for that to practice it, to, to, to uh, document yourself about it, to train about it, and not to just go on Google and go to Stack Overflow and take the first answer that you can get, yes. but rather to uh, explore as much as possible so you could see the most efficient solution you could have. And this is very important. Um, and this is actually, now I'm gonna answer as well on this question is like, I think, I think I'm telling my team all the time to invest time, uh, their personal time about the job as a consultant, also as a developer. Because if you want to get better, the only way you can do it is by practicing, uh, getting better reading, uh, doing further readings, uh, reading reference books, as we said during the, train, the, the presentation as well. This is very important for it. So, so I'm telling them that I'm, just, I'm giving them time to do it as well. Uh, but you need to know the state of the art about the languages the business and IT and everything. So you could talk to your customers, but you go get better as well as what you do. Is que j'ai le temps d'une petite précision, un exemple concret? Oui. Um, I'm ready for another translate. Let's go. <laughs> um, je prenais l'exemple tout à l'heure de, uh, de la programmation fonctionnelle. Uh, comme je disais, j'ai appris la programmation fonctionnelle il y a quelques mois. Et comment ça s'est passé Dans mon activité, je me suis mis à développer en React. 
et dans les dernières fonctionnalités de React, il y a les fonctionnel components. Et nous nous sommes mis à les utiliser. On a appris comment ça fonctionnait, c'est le cas de le dire. Et finalement, on a réussi à développer un, un produit qui était tout à fait satisfaisant en termes de qualité avec les composants fonctionnels de React. Mais clairement, moi le premier, je n'arrivais pas à comprendre comment ça fonctionnait réellement. Et donc, l'investissement en programmation fonctionnelle, je l'ai fait à titre personnel, à mes heures perdues, le soir, le week-end, pour me former réellement à la programmation fonctionnelle. Et c'est uniquement après ça que finalement, j'ai réussi à avoir une meilleure compréhension de ce que sont ces composants au sein du framework React. So, Eric, you, you are studying actually uh, functional programming right now, and what you are saying is that in the last project you had, you had to um, use React uh, as a language um, with, with functional components. With functional components that you guys didn't know, you didn't know uh, functional um, no. component before, so you had to learn about it. Um, you learn about it in your free time, in your personal time uh, to try things. And now in, at, the, at the end of the project, you managed to get a, a good product that was working, functional, uh, even though at first you didn't understand anything about functional programming, but you managed to do it because you spent time on it. Yes, exactly. Another question. Oh, <laughs> the last one. <laughs> um, there is a saying that says uh, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Quand on est un marteau, tout ressemble à un clou. When you are a software developer, everything looks like a software. But sometimes products shouldn't be a software. How can you say no? As a, as a developer, I say this is not a real software product. Do you understand the question? Okay. Is it coming from the chat or from you? <laughs> <laughs> I won't answer that question. <laughs> what you drink this morning? Cognac. Ah, cognac. Armenian cognac. Uh, I don't understand the question, but excuse me. So I say, I will read it in French. Yes. When on est un marteau, tout ce qu'on voit, ça ressemble à un clou. Mais quand on est un, quand on est un développeur de logiciel, parfois on dit, bah, voilà, n'importe quel produit, ça doit être un software. Sauf que ce n'est pas toujours vrai. Peut-être que c'est la bonne solution, ce n'est pas un software. Dans ces cas-là, comment toi, en tant que développeur, tu es dans la capacité de dire non, ce n'est pas, pas mon métier qui devrait être là, c'est un autre métier. Peut-être que c'est le fait de créer une vidéo, peut-être que c'est un autre outil, peut-être que c'est un autre produit qu'il faut construire. I can maybe take this one. I can try. Um, often I have customers um, they say, yes, we want to implement this and that. And I'm telling them, okay, but what is the reason behind that? Why do you want to do this? Uh, who is your target? I think it's very important as a developer first, because developer, if you think about it, um, about the definition of developer, because there are different definitions. You have developers, you have coders, you have programmers, but developers have this, should have this edge of analyze, analysis that he's capable of doing conception, conception of a product, but also have an idea about what business he's going to implement in a software or not. And therefore, to be able to say that, to say no to it, you can only say no to it if you inform yourself about what is there, what is there in, in the market, what is there in the business world, in the IT world, what exists. So you need to look outside of your company and the software world. You need to confront yourself with different activities. And therefore you would say, okay, actually I've seen something similar and it's not a software. So I don't think we should go with software. Okay, guys, thank thanks. Thank you very much. That was perfect. A big challenge for me. <laughs>
challenge accepted, challenge done. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you very much.